Very good. So it looks like it's about almost 6 o'clock, so we'll get started here pretty quick. Well, 7 Eastern. <laughs> oh, 7 Eastern, yes. It's 6 Central. Yes. 5 Mountain, 4 Pacific. All right. So we get started? Sure, let's get started. Okay, wonderful. So welcome everyone. Hello and good evening. Uh, I'm Kimberly Haugstead with the Hemophilia Federation of America and I'm delighted to uh, welcome you to our first webcast of 2013. And our webcast tonight is titled Preparing for Advocacy in 2013 and it's all about how the 113th Congress will impact you. So uh, it's a good night to be on and get some preliminary background information so we all know how to engage and, and have a good go forward. Um, Ebony, can you flip to the next slide? Thank you. Super. So at, at HSA, uh, you all know that advocacy is very, very important to us. It's one of our core missions and, and core objectives. And being an advocate is just so important in voicing support, in words and actions for a person or a cause, advancing interests, uh, really what advocacy and being an advocate is all about. And uh, being on this call alone, I think, identifies each one of you as an advocate, and, and, and you are advocates. I'll move to the next slide. And your story is is important. Your voice, your story, it matters. And uh, we encourage and support efforts across the country with our advocates to help individuals uh, learn how to tell their story in a, in a better and better way. And your story has power. It's very important. Uh, that genuine story is so much more important and more memorable than numbers alone. And so we encourage you uh, to work on and, and work with us in helping you to refine your story. And uh, again, that helps you as an advocate and helps in the advocacy process. Uh, making it personal versus uh, emotional or not rational is just so very, very important. Um, next slide. I have some really exciting information to share with you tonight. Uh, as of this last week, HFA has launched a new HFA website. And if you want to learn more about all of the policy priorities that we are working on, uh, and these key four priorities are, are listed here, but much, much more detail can be found on our new website. It is the same URL, www.hemophiliafed.org, but I encourage you to pop out and take a look at the, uh, the, the plethora of information that we have posted out for, uh, for all of our individuals in the community. And our four key priority areas are listed here. The Affordable Care Act implementation is certainly an ongoing priority for us, both a federal and state activity and lots of things happening uh, out in the states these days, of course. Uh, access to care, uh, preserving and improving the access to the care that we have today is, is a key priority. Safe therapies, we always um, always continue to, uh, to look towards, uh, towards supporting safety and, and, and good, good safe therapies for our community. And finally, data collection. And um, at HFA, we just believe very strongly in the importance of responsible and ethical data collection. And so we keep data collection as a key policy priority. So please stop out to our website and, uh, and take a look in detail uh, information on all of these priorities. And we'll talk about some of them ongoing throughout the year and are always available to, uh, to connect more to talk about details. Let's look to the next slide. There we go. Great. So a couple of, uh, of tools uh, among the many things that, that we're doing to support our community members. We do have two <clears throat> key things to, uh, to mention tonight. And uh, to support and provide education to our community, we do have an advocate resource toolkit that we have, uh, have developed. This is an ongoing living document uh, in the form of a binder and in form of, um, uh, if you want to go green, those information, uh, those items and information, it is available online for you as well. Uh, but that resource toolkit is just filled with all kinds of issue briefs, talking points, um, all kinds of different tools for you to use in the states when you're advocating at your various state, state entities and, and from a federal perspective. And those can be customized to, uh, to support you and your local needs as well. Uh, we also have six webinars coming up in 2013. 
and you'll see a list on the, the screen here of different topics. Those topics could change uh, based on, on things that are relevant and at hand, but, uh, but definitely six webinars to, to bring to you advocacy focused. Many other things that we're working on, and again, lots, lots of other activity going on at HFA, but these are two real hands-on tools that really can be leveraged and used uh, both visually uh, from a, a reading perspective and from a visual perspective with the webinars. So we're glad you're on tonight in the first webinar. Off to the next. I want to introduce tonight uh, our, our presenter, and uh, she will take us into some further details, uh, or lots of details, in terms of the changes in Congress, the new leadership in Congress, and uh, would like to introduce Ebony Morris. Ebony is our public policy director and, and, and will offer us some deep insight tonight into uh, some further leadership. And Ebony, I'm going to toss the baton to you to go ahead and start walking through the 113th Congress, if you don't mind. Thanks, Kimberly. Yeah. Um, and uh, just a reminder for everyone tonight, one thing I forgot to mention at the onset is that if you have a question during the webinar, um, you can raise your hand or you can send um, myself um, and a question directly. So if you have any questions, um, you can send them or raise your hand um, and we'll have an open Q&A afterwards. Um, also, just to let you know, um, these slides will be posted on the website and the recording as well as soon as we get through processing and, and being able to condense it to post it. So it will be on the website for you to share or listen to later. So, um, and thanks everyone for um, logging in tonight and listening. So for um, this year's Congress, I guess I'll just jump right into it. Um, as you can see, um, the House, there are 232 Republicans. So they, um, after this election cycle, they maintain control of the House. Um, there are still three vacancies due to some um, re retirees and, and a couple of the folks stepping down um, in the Senate. There are 53 Democrats and 45 Republicans, two independents who caucus with the Democrats. So as you can see, a little bit more of the same. Um, a balance shifted a little bit. The Democrats were able to pick up some momentum, but um, still very um, people, I guess the correct term would be bipartisan, but it, it seems nowadays to be very partisan. So um, you can expect um, some more of the same um, partisan issues to return, and we'll get into some of that later. There are 85 new House members, so um, there are a lot of opportunity to educate members of Congress, especially if you're in um, someone's district who is new. And we'll talk about later some of the resources we have on our website that may help you find out who your um, members of Congress are. There are 13 new Senate members. Um, 98 women in Congress, which um, is historical, so a little bit more diversity. Um, there is also some diversity, um, religious diversity. There are a couple of um, non-Christian members who were elected as well. So, um, and oh, definitely um, the Latino population picked up some more members of Congress as well. So, different um, levels of diversity operating within Congress, and also through redistricting, Texas gained the most House seats. I believe about four. So um, there was a little bit of change there as well. So just to go over and give you guys a, um, a feel for who's in leadership or who's still in leadership, um, there wasn't a lot of change or surprises um, from the House side. As you can see, um, John Boehner from Ohio remained the speaker. Um, and Nancy Pelosi remained the minority leader, the leader of the Democrats. So you can go through and see um, some of the leadership and in, in the states they represent. It's, it's key to know and um, be familiar with if um, someone from your state is in leadership that can um, help um, definitely um, the bleeding disorders community a lot. So you can see some variation in the states represented. Um, and I think a new face here would, and, and as far as the Republican leadership would be um, Kathy McMorris Rogers as conference chair um, and Democratic caucus chair um, Javier Becerra from California. So um, you can shift, familiarize yourself with this list and like I said this stuff will be posted. Um, these, these leadership positions are key 
um, in, in the House of Representatives. So as far as the committees go, um, the main chair of the standing committees, um, most of them have been appointed and confirmed. There's still some um, subcommittee positions that we're still waiting on hearing final results from, but as you can see from um, the appropriations, the chair will be Hal Rogers from Kentucky um, and um, the subcommittee chair for Labor, Health and Human Services will be Jack Kingston um, from Georgia. Um, and for the budget committee, Paul Ryan uh, remained chair of that committee as well. Um, and just to step back for a minute and t talk about, I guess, the House uh, dynamics and kind of what we expect um, the Republican and Democratic agenda um, to be, and I think this is probably true for both um, House and Senate, but really for the House, I think that the Republicans coming out of the election really um, have seen um, that they were really like to put more energy into developing more policy um, recommendations and building an actual agenda um, instead of being more reactive and um, kind of just blocking or saying no to whatever the Democrats put forward, but putting forth their own strong agenda. So we'll definitely, and we have in in this last few weeks just seen uh, um, um, act, a lot of activity come out of, of Congress already. So, And obviously for Democrats, they want to maintain that momentum. They feel that they've gained from the elections as far as um, coming back and getting a few more seats. Obviously they were hopeful to, to um, get back control of the House, but obviously that didn't happen. So as far as the committees, um, and just to give you a little bit of background on the differences, I know some people may not know um, the, the differences in what appropriations and budget and, and different committees do. Um, the Appropriations Committee basically sets the expenditure levels um, for the federal government to Congress, so they kind of set the tone for how much money will be available for Congress uh, to spend, and um, obviously a very powerful committee on the House side and as well as the Senate side. Um, the Budget Committee then takes that and um, sets the federal agencies' budgets, individual budgets, um, for them as well. So it kind of hands down from appropriations down to the Budget Committee. And another key, and these um, committees um, were high, obviously I'm not going to go through all of the, the House committees, but these are some of the key committees that um, our bills related to the bleeding disorders community, um, these committees will probably have jurisdiction over. So I think it's important um, for everyone to know who the leadership on these committees are and um, possibly if these are people that um, represent you or, or your direct representatives. Um, so for Energy and Commerce, the chair, again, is Fred Umpton from Michigan. Um, and the ranking member is Henry Waxman from California. And for the subcommittee on health, the chair is Joe Pitts from Pennsylvania. And the ranking member is uh, Frank Pallone from New Jersey. Um, and Energy and Commerce um, definitely has broad ju jurisdiction over um, most health-related issues. Um, for example, the Energy and Commerce oversees uh, seven federal agencies and uh, five cabinet members. Um, so anything related to health, and the health Department of Health and Human Services come on, comes under their jurisdiction. Obviously, um, agencies like the FDA, Food and Drug Administration, which is key to regulating um, blood and, and blood products that um, the community relies on. Um, obviously, CDC, there's a, obviously a lot of activity and a lot of work that um, the bleeding disorders community does with the CDC. Um, so there's a strong relationship there as well. And for Ways and Means, um, the chair is Dave Camp from Michigan, and the ranking member is, is Sandra Levin from Michigan as well. Um, and Ways and Means is key, especially in, in these um, times, because they oversee a lot of the revenue raising and uh, tax writing power. So Social Security comes under their jurisdiction as well as Medicare. Um, and obviously we've heard a lot about chain, potential changes to those programs to um, to raise revenue for the government. 
And just some other background, the Subcommittee on Health under Ways and Means, the chair is Kevin Brady from Texas, and the ranking member is Jim McDermott from Washington. And the Subcommittee on Social Security, the chair is Sam Johnson from Texas, and the ranking member is Javier Becerra from California. And um, another committee which is going to be key, especially with the Affordable Care Act, um, oversight and government reform. Um, this committee is, is going to be key because, um, as we've seen, obviously a lot of the, the Republican objections to the Affordable Care Act, this committee has the jurisdiction to investigate and issue subpoenas um, to people to come before Congress um, and unilaterally. So it really doesn't need a full uh, committee vote. So if the chair sees an issue that he wants to investigate, um, he can bring that uh, to, to um, uh, Congress's attention, and so definitely a lot of um, power there. And they also have a subcommittee on health care and entitlements um, as well. So the chair for um, oversight and government reform is Daryl Issa from California, and the ranking member is Elijah Cummings from Maryland. Um, and the chair for the health and, and entitlement subcommittee is James Lankford from Oklahoma, and the ranking member is Jackie Spear from California. And one fun fact I learned about James Langford is that he is the first congressman from Oklahoma with red hair. So you can tell that at your part trivia parties as well. So for the Senate, um, as I mentioned earlier, a little bit of the same. Uh, the majority leader remains Harry Reid from Nevada, and the minority leader Mitch McConnell from um, Kentucky. Um, and you can read for yourself who the key um, leadership on both sides are. I think the, the new face for the Senate leadership in, on the Democratic side would be Patty Murray as um, conference secretary. So, um, which is important, as you can see from the leadership in the Senate, she appears to be the only woman. So um, it's good to see some female representation there. So for the com committee, oops, I skipped one. Um, for, so for the committee leadership um, in the Senate, um, similar, we, we um, monitor the similar um, committees in the Senate. So for appropriations, um, the chair is Barbara Mikulski. Um, and um, she's an interesting chair in that she has a strong interest in health and health policy issues, so definitely very friendly to, um, would be def definitely very friendly to our issues and concerns. And the ranking member is uh, Thad Cochran from Mississippi. And the Subcommittee on Labor and Health and Human Services, um, the chair is Tom Harkin, who's also um, definitely an advocate for um, health care and people with d d disabilities and other health care challenges. So definitely um, a friend of the community as well. And the ranking member is Richard Shelby from Alabama. For her budget, um, the chair is Patty Murray, and the ranking member is Jeff Sessions out of Alabama. Um, finance, which is similar to, I would say, the Ways and Means Committee in, on the House side. Um, the chair is Max Baucus from Montana, and the ranking member is Orrin Hatch from Utah. Um, and the, the Help Committee is kind of self-explanatory. The chair is Tom Harkin, and the ranking member is Michael N Enzi from Wyoming. So. Um, there's your kind of key list of um, leadership there on some of the com on the committees we primarily follow here at, at HFA and definitely would have um, would oversee a lot of um, the issues that um, face the bleeding disorders community. So um, <clears throat> as far as kind of looked at all of the the committees and seen who the leadership is, but. I just wanted to briefly go into some of the issues, the key issues that kind of overlap with um, federal and, and, and state uh, jurisdiction or will definitely have an impact on you at, at the local level. Um, definitely the, the top um, issue right now is the Affordable Care Act implementation. Um, and as we know, we've seen over the last couple of years that the federal government has decided to um, allow states um, the ability to lead on the insurance exchange development. However, we do know that most states have either elected to not implement an exchange or do a, a federal-state partnership. 
So definitely, um, we're still anxiously awaiting to hear how the federal government plans on implementing the federal exchange. We really haven't heard a lot about that, um, even less than um, state implementation. So um, it's that's definitely been really challenging, and we hope in this next Congress and this next um, year um, that either Congress will push to, to hear back from HHS about how the exchange will work. Um, we definitely um, need to know because open enrollment is um, starting in October of this year, so it's coming up fairly quickly. And obviously in relation to that, the central health benefits and um, seeing how states and how and on for this instance, how the federal government will ensure that plans that they're offering will um, cover um, the necessary items that were listed out in the law under essential health benefits. Another issue that has come up within a, the Affordable Care Act, um, which has popped up again, is the issue of the Independent Payment Advisory Board. Um, and just a brief background on that, this is a board that um, will come into play if Medicare spending rises to a certain level. This um, board appointed by the Secretary of, I'm sorry, by the President um, will have the ability to recommend certain cuts to um, certain um, benefits within, and really payments, um, so certain providers, hospital payments within Medicare if spending reaches a certain point. So there has been a lot of activity, especially on the Republican side, and they have introduced bills to repeal this provision within the law, and this will definitely, and already has, I believe that there are some bills already introduced to repeal um, IPAB. Another big issue, obviously, is Medicaid expansion. Um, and just to, kind of in line with even Medicaid in general, um, there obviously has been some talk around the fiscal cliff around how to um, get a get a wrap around Medicaid, even though Medicaid is not eligible to be cut under that process. But there are still some talks about those types of entitlement programs. And as the federal government is also trying to encourage states to expand Medicaid, that can be problematic if Congress steps in and wants to make some changes um, to the program we saw last session on proposals to make it into a block grant program. So things of, of that nature that definitely can impact whether states um, choose to expand Medicaid or not. Another issue that we're looking at um, under the ACA is biosimilars, which um, potentially is the ability for um, pharmaceutical companies to um, make drugs that are uh, similar, um, supposed to be clinically significant or similar to um, an original drug. So basically uh, a generic version of a biologic drug. So clotting factor, for example, is categorized as a biologic. And now companies um, with FDA guidance have the ability to create generic um, products based, based on, on, on the original product. And we know that um, we're still waiting on hearing more from the FDA about how this process will work, but there also is a state component to that, and that states will definitely have to come up and introduce legislation or regulation to also deal with new generic pro products as well. So this is both a federal and state issue. I already briefly discussed Medicaid and potential threats to, to Medicaid or changes to the program. Another issue that kind of got real momentum on the state level but has um, definitely um, been brought up on at the federal level are, are the issues of specialty tiers and cost sharing um, and insurance plans. This definitely was an issue many states and many of you ha may have been involved in the local level in advocating for legislation to ban this practice of charging um, consumers a percentage of the cost of their drug, um, which is obviously in the bleeding disorders community is extremely expensive. And currently in the last session there was um, legislation introduced um, called the Patient Access to Affordable Treatment Act. Um, last session the, the bill number was HR 4209. Um, it will be reintroduced this year as a bipartisan legislation and will be introduced um, in a few weeks. So we are part of HFA and I believe NHF and a couple of other um, organizations we work with, the Immune Deficiency Foundation, um, Patient Services Incorporated, PSI. We're all a part of um, a 
larger coalitions to patient and provider groups that support this legislation. Um, and through the process, we're finding that many uh, members of Congress do not know or understand issues of cost, cost sharing and insurance. They don't understand co-insurance. They don't understand um, how specialty tiers are able to exist. Um, and then also general fear of trying to go back in and regulate insurance companies after the Affordable Care Act. So you're facing, we have a lot of support and the bill has been bipartisan. We're also in an environment where many do not want to deal with another um, health insurance regulation again. So, but um, from this bill, we can see that it, the issue taken on by the states has definitely risen to the federal level and we've gotten some activity there as well. And also uh, Medicare and Social Security, we've heard a lot of talks in the last few months around potential changes to um, Medicare and Social Security, potentially um, raising the eligibility age, raising payroll taxes to support these programs. So definitely something um, we're watching and that you need to watch and be um, and be mindful of any changes to those programs as well. A couple of other things, um, treatments, uh, funding for hemophilia treatment centers. Of course, um, we, we support uh, full access to treatment centers um, and also support the CDC and the Maternal Child Health Bureau um, and their work and funding of treatment centers. So um, as you, some of you may recall last um, Congress, the President's budget recommended slight cuts to the program. And there also um, were some a lot of other changes that MCHB went through as far as regions um, being condensed and other CDC priorities within bleeding disorders had also shifted. So there's a lot of activity within the hemophilia program within both of those two agencies. And um, so we're definitely um, waiting to see what happens this year in Congress and what the funding levels will be. So will definitely um, be in support of full funding for the treatment centers. Other issues that have come up, um, specialty pharmacy and home care marketplace, and um, basically networks and availability. We saw a lot of activity um, last Congress with some members introducing bills to kind of protect um, small businesses around involved in specialty pharmacy and attempting to regulate um, the PBM industry, kind of the larger pharmacy benefit managers. Um, and obviously many of you have also experienced changes in your network and single provider kind of agreements with your insurance companies as well. So definitely an issue that um, some members of Congress have taken up and are aware of and we'll definitely um, keep tabs on that as well. And uh, finally the, the biggest issue which has been all over the news is the fiscal cliff and sequestration. So um, the last congressional action around this issue kind of separated out those two deadlines. So the actual sequestration deadline is still going to be March 1st. Um, however, the debt ceiling was raised until May. So um, kind of a couple of different uh, financial scenarios that could potentially um, work its way out. Um, but we know through the sequestration process that discretionary funding is up for cuts. Um, so cuts to a lot of the agencies that support a lot of the work that goes on in the bleeding disorders community. So to the FDA, to the CDC, to NIH, or some of um, the bigger agencies that we work with and that definitely impact um, your access to care and the healthcare system in general, and research. Um, and you can see from um, the image on the screen some of the, the potential impact of cuts to medical research and NIH. If it's just one example of if these cuts go through, what can potentially happen um, within those agencies. So you may now be thinking, um, what can you do and how can you get involved? And Kimberly will go through some of the ways that we advise um, people to get involved and, and stay on top of these advocacy issues. Absolutely, I'd be happy to. Thank you, Ebony, and thanks for the, the thorough background here. And I'm sure there are lots of questions queuing up that we'll open up the lines uh, for in just a minute. Uh, but, but to take a look at this slide, and, and I think what you can do is just such a powerful statement and such a great call to action. So I'm glad that we've 
positioned it here. And, and I think really uh, we as community really are the best and the experts to speak for, for our own needs. And so there's, there's just no one better to tell your own personal story and, uh, and to describe what you need better than you yourself. So we would challenge you um, to choose to be accountable and, uh, and do what you can do. And so um, getting, you know, choosing and, and committing to educating yourself, getting involved, knowing your legislator, all of these things are, are just so key and important. And we encourage you to do what you can do and, uh, and get involved. Uh, meeting and, and knowing who your legislators are, ensuring that they know you, uh, and working with other advocacy groups. Ebony specifically mentioned, mentioned NHF, who we work with on a regular basis, the A plus group, uh, many organizations, uh, we, we have experience working outside of hemophilia and within hemophilia. So if you're looking for ideas and thoughts and how you can connect in your state with other advocacy groups maybe that you've never worked with before, it could be the MS groups or the diabetes groups or whoever, uh, there could be key issues uh, and are key issues where we can work together. So do consider other advocacy groups. Uh, and getting to know your, your health commissioners, your insurance uh, uh, commissioners, really um, a, a good important step for us. Uh, and Medicaid director and your pharmacy, Medicaid pharmacy directors as, as well. So developing your personal story, we've identified certainly, and, and you know, is so, so very important to be able to, um, to, to share your story and really make it real and explaining uh, what will work best for you and, uh, and what will work best for you in your state. We go to the next slide. Um, this also, there we go. Internet pause, all right. So, um, so other things that you can do, and this slide very specifically offers some uh, numerous opportunities and options for you to, uh, to learn and get more information. And we encourage and, and uh, actively encourage you to take advantage of the email alerts, the Legislative Action Center communication, uh, the state information that we post on our website, uh, you know, finding your members of Con Congress, your state legislators, uh, local member organizations. There's just a ton of information to be found uh, on our website and on your, your local website with your local member organization uh, um, with HFA. Um, so, it, and I guess, um, you know, th there are other ways, I think they're noted here, Facebook, Twitter, Dateline, lots, lots of opportunity for you to get actively involved. Following this call, uh, we challenge you that if you're not already signed up for our alerts and communication uh, at HFA, please do so. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's another opportunity for, for input and information. Next slide. Another opportunity uh, for you to, uh, to colleague with others uh, is to attend our, our symposium. Our educational symposium uh, is coming together in April this year, April 25th through the 27th. We'll be in Dallas, Texas, and about 700 or so individuals from around the country, people with bleeding disorders and their families, will attend. And this is a great opportunity face-to-face -to, -face to share and learn from others. Uh, we do have a number of first-time attendee travel scholarships left as well. So if you haven't been to a symposium before, uh, I highly recommend you take advantage of the opportunity. And if you have been before, please come back. So we, we definitely hope to see you there at symposium. And there will be a number of advocacy sessions, uh, as well as other peer support and peer advocacy sessions, uh, personal advocacy sessions uh, during the symposium. Oh, there's some more. All right. <laughs> At our website. There you go. Great. So while Ebony's queuing the last slide up, really we're, we're reaching out with a big thank you to everyone tonight for being on the call tonight and for your interest and your willingness to learn more and get more actively involved. We do want to offer, and, and we'll share this contact information, but we want to open up this, the lines now for some continued questions. Uh, so for some open open questions. Um, and Ebony, I don't know, do you have any queued? No, not yet. Um, so if anybody has any questions, you want to raise your hand, you can um, do that um, with the side panel on your screen. Or you can um, okay. send your question in to us if you have any. So if someone raises their hand, Ebony, you can open them up. Uh, live so they can ask their question? Yep. Okay, fantastic.
See, I guess no one has any questions or comments. So um, thank you for participating. If you think of any questions or have any concerns or um, want to start communicating with your legislator, please contact us. We do have um, a legislative action center on our website, and we have the ability for you to enter in your address, and you can find who your legislators are on the local, so city, um, state, and federal. Um, and we can assist with helping you craft any messages um, you have for them, or if you just want to know who they are. So um, please visit the website and, and go to our Legislative Action Center to, to find out that information. Great. And our next webinar, I believe, is March 27th. So uh, please watch for that invitation, or I believe you can sign up already if you go to our uh, website calendar or the calendar on our website, there is a um, uh, link to uh, sign up for the next session. Um, and we also um, will be sending out these slides um, afterwards. Wait, we have a question, so I'll unmute um, Janelle has a question. Janelle, you need to enter in your audio pin. I cannot unmute you yet. Or you can send, type me your question. Wait, I see some other questions. Let me try to explain, expand. Oh, um, so a couple of questions. Yes, the slides will be available separately, so I can send the slides to anyone who, want, who wants them separately. Um, and the other question was, what is a great first question um, to ask my representative? Um, and I'm not sure if um, you really have to ask a first question or really just be able to talk to them about who you are and that you're in their district. Um, and your concerns. So if you're living with a bleeding disorder, if you have a concern about making sure that you still have access to care and access to your product, then that's something that you may want to mention. Or if you're having trouble accessing those things, um, so getting to a, a, an appropriate provider or um, getting your uh, medicine in a timely fashion, then that's something um, you may want to bring up too. I think one of the first things you probably would be good to ask is if they're familiar with the bleeding disorder and if they're familiar with the type of bleeding disorder that you have. So if you have hemophilia, then it may be appropriate to say, hi, you know, my name, where you live, and ask them, are they familiar with hemophilia? And sometimes that's a good icebreaker because they may say yes, and sometimes somebody can surprise you and say, um, I mean, some, most times they'll say no, but sometimes someone can surprise you and say, oh, yes, I think I heard of it. They may have some assumptions or may have heard some myths about, the, about hemophilia. So I would say starting out with, are you familiar um, with uh, bleeding disorders, um, kind of is a good icebreaker. I see another question, and I'm trying to expand these, but it doesn't. Oh, here we go. Um, we are developing um, talking points around, um, there's a question, I'm sorry, there, the question is around co-insurance and getting legislators to, to understand um, about how insurance works, how co-insurance works, how cost sharing works, how a specialty tier may work. We don't personally have that yet, we're developing that, but on the website we have the talking points um, and FAQs for the federal legislation that deals with specialty tiers and it discusses um, in, layman's terms, in layman's terms why this issue is important and how it affects people. So um, paying a certain percentage and I can send that along to you but we, def we have the talking points around the issue, this piece of legislation that deals with the issue specifically but we're in the process of developing a separate um, issue brief and talking points around specialty tiers and, and cost sharing. So hopefully that will be helpful.
Another question um, around telling your story and, and, and um, trying not, not to be emotional. Um, I think the biggest thing and the best thing may, may be to um, try and maybe practice with someone. Um, it's hard, and it's, I don't think there's anything wrong with being a little bit emotional, but I think practicing, trying to keep it condensed maybe within a minute or two, and maybe practicing um, with someone that um, is not familiar with your situation, um, I think is, is helpful. But definitely practicing so that you can get um, almost desensitizing yourself from, from the situation, kind of role, maybe role-playing with someone. Um, to get their sense of your situation, but we definitely have some resources around story sharing, so I can um, send that to you as well. Um, but but I think practicing and developing it within a certain time frame may um, be helpful. Ebony, this is Kimberly. I have a question. What what do you think of um, additional props or, you know, a photograph or a factor bottle or, or those kinds of things? Are they effective taking along with you to uh, to share your, your story? Definitely um, uh, your medicine um, is is um, is helpful. I think um, your explanation of benefits, so EOB, um, I think is very helpful because many people that are quote unquote healthy never look at their ex explanation of benefits but um, for the bleeding disorders community that's essential and vital to know how much was covered and and um, what what has occurred so I think showing um, the your member of Congress or their staff and leaving them a copy maybe you know crossing out your personal information but leaving a copy of your explanation of benefits uh, maybe um, the box from your factor and showing them the factor and um, all everything that's involved with it, not necessarily going into infusing, but showing them um, the factor and the ancillary supplies that you need to infuse, um, I think are two key things that, that are helpful. And also, um, you mentioned a photograph, Kimberly, and potentially maybe a photograph of an area where you have a bleed or your child or your family member had a bleed um, may be helpful as well. Um, another question about where to start in advocacy, um, I would say is just developing your personal relationship with your elected officials. So if you voted for someone, I would say if they're in office right now, just send them a letter and say, I'm so-and-so, I'm in your district, and I'm watching what you're doing, and, um, and keeping track. Um, as we mentioned, all, all legislators now have different ways of communicating out what they're working on and what they're doing. So signing up for their email list, signing up for their Facebook or on their Twitter um, and keeping track, I think is an easier first step. Um, and watching what they're voting on and how they're voting. Um, so if you can build your relationship there personally, I think that's the best thing that you can do. Um, I would say other things you can do is take the time at any point to advocate and educate people about bleeding disorders. Um, we here at HFA talk about the difference between um, policy advocacy and personal advocacy, and there are times where you can just educate people um, about some of these issues, and you don't necessarily have to be pushing a political issue, but um, in discussions with people sometimes, you know, people it's especially around healthcare, may not understand um, how important some of these issues as far as coverage and requiring insurance companies to do certain things because they haven't experienced that yet. And so they don't understand that um, if the insurance company has the ability to do X, Y, and Z, and that may lead to me being permanently disabled or, you know, something even more, you know, worse. So. Um, definitely, I would say the first step is trying to communicate directly with your legislator in simple messages. We have examples on our website, and you can definitely contact us directly if there's something that you would like to communicate to them but want help in crafting that message. We can definitely um, help you with that, um, I think, is a good first step. Um, also, within your community, if there are health advocacy organizations and if they're doing meetings or any type of organizing, maybe reaching out um, to those as well.
So I'm looking through the, oh, um, another question um, was around the difference between um, a chair of a committee and a ranking member. So, which I should have explained. So this is a really great question. The chair of the committee is usually, is always a member of the party who is, um, has control of, of that entity. So on the Senate side, all of the chairs will be Democrats and all of the ranking members will be Republicans. And on the, in the House of Representatives, all of the chairs are Republican and all the ranking members are um, Democrats. So they're basically the top leadership of their party on that committee, representing their party on that committee. So those are the differences between the chair and the ranking member. So um, if the, the um, say the Senate or the House shifts and who's in, who has more people, then you'll see the shift in whoever is the chair or the ranking member. Then the Democrat in the House of Representatives will become the chair and then the Republican becomes the ranking member. So hopefully that answers that question. I'm looking through to see if anybody else has any other questions. I don't see any. But you guys had some great questions, so thank you. Yep, I'm looking through. I don't see any more questions. So uh, thanks everyone for the for the questions. Very helpful, I think, for me and for everyone else. So it's always good to ask questions because um, somebody may be thinking something, the same thing, and may be afraid to ask it. So thank you, everyone, for submitting your questions um, to us. And on that note, we will close for the evening. Um, like I said, I will be sending out the slides um, to everyone who is registered and has attended. And then the slides and the audio will be posted on HFA's website um, shortly, probably within the next week or so. So thank you, everyone, for attending. Appreciate it. And look out for our next webinar um, in March. Good night. <laughs>